Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to uh, this first edition of the Journey Latin America uh, Hangout on Air. Uh, we've, I have to say we've started slightly with a, a glitch. The Hangout on Air is being hosted uh, by Chris. You can see their wave, Chris but who we can't actually hear at the moment because his microphone seems to have broken. Um, so he's with us at least in spirit, uh, if not in audio. Uh, and uh, I'm also joined uh, by uh, Karen, uh, Karen Fanshaw here from R Blaster and Clark and by Steve Keenan. Uh, and I can hear some audio coming in from the JLA site now, so that's encouraging. I think we've, um, we may have solved the problem. Okay, uh, not, not, not me. I'm just going to mute for a moment, if I can mute your microphone. Uh, that's better. Okay, right. Um, now we've got too much of a, uh, audio from from JLA, so I've just muted their their microphone. But it's looking as if that's beginning to uh, beginning to work. Okay, uh, everybody. The idea behind this, um, and Karen's joined us twice. The idea behind this is uh, really that we're going to talk about an article that Steve wrote back in 2003 um, for the uh, Times newspaper, and it was entitled uh, The Real Holiday Experts. There it is. Uh, and uh, what it did was it listed a whole group of really pioneering um, independent tour operators who are carving out terrific niches for themselves. Uh, and so what I'd, I'd like to do is, uh, if I can just start with Steve, uh, and get you to just describe what the article was about and what kind of conclusions you were trying to draw from it. Thanks, Alistair. Morning, everybody. Hope to see more of you shortly and hear more from you shortly. But as Alistair said, just to introduce it, it was uh, doing a lot of ATO meetings and conferences over the years and obviously ATO stands for specialist tour operators doing things well. So I got to know a bunch of the guys and ladies and women quite well and I was always impressed by the people who had originally started tours and in chatting with them it became obvious that what they started with by and large was the tour that's still their best selling tour. So in the case of our blaster and cart it was Champagne. In the case of Journey Latin America, it was Machu Picchu. Uh, Clive Stacey, he's always specialised in Iceland and so on. And what I loved about these guys, it was at a time that a lot of small tour operators had sold out to the bigger boys, the Thompsons of the world, who were mopping up dozens and dozens of bespoke tour operators and doing very little with them and killing them off. So it occurred to me that these guys are actually worth a great deal of anybody's time and, and attention because they continued to be run by the people who set them up in the first place. They've been going for at least 10, 15 years, in some cases 20, 30, and they're still selling tours that sold in the first place, but it evolved and moved into other areas as well. So I just thought these are worth paying attention to. These are the real holiday experts, the ones who knew what they were doing, or didn't know what they were doing when they started, but certainly got to know the market and their people incredibly well. And they were, they were worth a bit of recognition. So I think it was at a NATO uh, AGM that I got together 20 of them, put them all together in the room, uh, got photographs of about 17 of them. They very kindly sent me pictures of themselves when they'd started back in the 70s, 80s, or 90s in some cases, and we put them all together, a little interview with a picture of them then and a picture of them at the time 10 years ago, and reflected how much skill and knowledge there is in the travel industry. I was about to turn at that point to Karen and, and ask if she was in that group. Certainly R. Blaster and Clark were in that group, I think, weren't they, when you uh, first wrote that article? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah, Lynette and um, Tim yes. had started with a coach tour to Champagne area. That's what he did at the time, was get a coach. What everybody wanted to do was to go there, have a look around the vineyards, not have to drive, but come back with two or three cases of champagne in the coach. Very simplistic way to do, and I think they still do vast numbers of these trips all the way to not all the way to Champagne. They diversified this year. I think they're into Georgia mm -hmm. wine tours. You know, fantastic niche stuff, but the, their love at the time was getting the Champagne experts, the right people in the small vineyards, pointing them in the direction of a place that's not going to charge you a vast amount of money for a substandard bottle of Champagne, and uh, bring it home to you. In fact, they were the people 
who put me onto a small champagne house called Philip Brun, where I got my wedding champagne from many years later. <laughs> so thank you very much, Ablatha and Clark. Excellent. Uh, it, it's such a shame that Karen's, uh, I hope, temporarily disappeared uh, because uh, we could have asked her about uh, A, Georgia, but also it reminds me that um, one of the characteristics, I think, of, of the pioneering independent tour operators is their ability to uh, identify new and interesting markets and new areas to go into and to build really good product on the ground there. Um, and a classic example of that would be when Lynette went to uh, India, went up into the uh, into the hills of the foothills of the Himalayas, and um, for a brief while started uh, tea tours. And as if on cue, uh, Karen has uh, has turned up again. Karen, we were just talking about. I was about to ask you if you were, if you had been in that original photograph, but of course it was Lynette who I think was in that uh, that that first group. Just tell us about our blaster and Clark and uh, and how it got started. And yeah. it of course, yes, absolutely. Um, Yes, I can, yes. <laughs> um, Tim and I look a little bit different today. Um, yes, over 25 years ago, uh, a very young uh, Lynette Arblaster was working um, in Portugal for another tour operator, and she became very good friends with uh, one of the leading winemakers, now one of the leading winemakers in Portugal, who was actually an Australian, one of the early flying winemakers. Um, and at the same time, Tim Clark had come out of insurance and was desperate to follow his passion, which was wine. Uh, they met and got talking um, in the pub, I suspect, and thought, well, what makes a great holiday? Uh, talking about wine and food and hotels. Um, and that's really where the very original uh, Arblast on Clark Champagne Weekend was born. Um, over 25 years ago, we ran our very first one, 99 quid, uh, leaving from Petersfield. Uh, business was drummed up by handing out leaflets in pubs, etc. Um, and we still run that very same Champagne Weekend today. Um, it's changed very, very little. They hit on a winning formula right at the beginning, and something we still do to this very, very day. It's a bit more than 99 pounds though, these days. I think that's something that uh, that actually happens quite often. That some of those core uh, tours that that independent tour operators establish turn out to be some some of their longest lasting and most and most popular. Uh, and and it's great to see that that's the case. But we were just saying while you're away that one of the other characteristics of uh, independent, local, and pioneering uh, tour operators is their ability to adapt and see new markets and new areas. And I'm absolutely sure that I remember uh, talking to Lynette some a few years ago, probably probably about a decade ago now, I should think, um, uh, and her talking about a, a, a tea tour that they'd yes. tapped on because they were doing because she'd been up into the foothills of the Himalayas and thought this is fantastic. This, I didn't realise there were so many varieties of tea and the, and you know tea plant and we could apply the same formula to our, our, our tours there. Absolutely. Um, we did indeed run a couple of very successful trips to Sri Lanka, um, tea tasting, and just going carrying on on that theme, we've also done whiskey tours. Um, we do have in the pipeline a, a rum cruise, um, which may well come, come to fruition at some stage. We've done beer tours, um, So, and, and we have looked at coffee as well. So yes, absolutely. Um, let me just for uh, anybody for, for for those who are watching, let me just uh, sort of recap here. Um, we're rather hoping that um, that Clive is going to join us, Clive Stacy uh, from Discover the World, but we haven't seen him yet. Um, we've been having a lot of technical problems this morning with getting this uh, Hangout on Air up and running, uh, and uh, one of the aspects of that is that we've not been able to get everybody's uh, lower third in place, so you can't see who everybody is. So let me just run from left to right very quickly. I'm Alistair McKenzie. I'm a journalist and I've been a travel journalist since 1989 uh, on the radio. Uh, almost as long as me at the far end of the screen is Steve Keenan who's been doing it. I think he and I have been pretty much at it the same for the same period and it was Steve who wrote this original article in 2003 in the Times that we've uh, used as our uh, as our theme today. Uh, on the left, uh, to my right, uh, number two if you go from the left, uh, is uh, Karen Fan from our blaster and Clark um, that's uh, to her right is Amy Molson who is uh, JLA's um, digital guru and is trying to sort out their tech problems at <laughs> that end uh, and to her right uh, is uh, Chris Parrott uh, who is uh, JLA's uh, managing director is it managing director Chris I'm not sure um, uh, 
and uh, we're hoping that his audio is going to be working soon because we'd love to have him uh, join in. Okay, uh, if anybody has any questions or anything like that, just to add more layers of complexity to this, uh, then uh, do use the hashtag JLAHOA uh, and use it on Twitter and uh, with any luck we should spot that and um, uh, we'll uh, try and pick it up and, uh, and answer those questions. Uh, and uh, Chris has just said he's actually just a director, not the managing director, so there you go, corrected. Um, Steve, uh, you mentioned ATO then. You said you collected together a bunch of ATO uh, operators. Let's just uh, just briefly talk about uh, ATO. T tell everybody what it is. Uh, it's an acronym for the Association of Independent Tier Operators. No idea how long it's been going. 70s, Chris? 1970s, 80s, possibly a bit later. But as it, as it I implies, they're independent. They're not owned by one of the larger conglomerates. A lot of the operators had to leave ATO in the 80s, 90s when they were snapped up by First Choice and, and Thompson, as I mentioned earlier. There was a whole headlong rush at the time by the big boys to think they needed a bit more sophistication. They're in a period of growth as well, so they're into acquisitions to make it larger. I remember first Thompson destroyed several companies by forcing them to move to their headquarters, for example, and not leaving the, the people who were behind the companies didn't want to go to Luton or other places north. And so uh, those companies collapsed. First Choice were much better. They bought one cottage company, for example, and put their back end in, their operate accounting systems, but when it came to EU law, like swimming pools, they only put glazed letters into the pool to indicate <laughs> debts. They did it beautifully. But first choice is a large operator. So I would imagine from a height of possibly 70, 80 original tour operators in the 70s, 80s, there are probably less, about 15 left now in so, 80. But what's happened so is that the smaller ones have come through subsequently. Online businesses primarily and not the big old cart horse brochure and package companies that were there before. As a travel editor, uh, you probably feel the same way as I do, and I'm going to ask Karen if what her perspective is from the other end. Um, uh, I've always considered ATO to be probably the number one most significant piece of uh, advice I could give to any consumer any time. Uh, in other words, it's the piece that I keep, keep having to repeat more often than anything else. Uh, if you want to find something really a bit different, a bit special, a real expertise in the particular niche area, then uh, you, you want to go to ATO. Uh, Karen, is that the way you, you feel about it? Because you guys have been ATO uh, operators for a long time. Absolutely, yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't um, endorse what you're saying highly enough. It, it, within ATO, you have, exactly as Steve has said, um, usually owner-managed, but people who are absolutely passionate about what they do and passionate to give people the, the best holiday that they can in the area that they have chosen to specialise in. And those people that you speak to when you, when you ring any of these companies um, are very likely to have travelled to the region that you want to go to. They're very likely to have slept in the hotel that you're talking about. They know the restaurants, etc., etc. And that level of expertise is really second to none. And it's also, it comes uh, with all the bells and whistles that consumers associate with large organizations uh, like, um, uh, like ABTA. So, in other words, an ATO operator will come with a, 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 a full um, trust backing, uh, if, you know, financial backing if something goes wrong, uh, in exactly the same way that uh, you'd expect to get your money back from ATO if one of their operators collapses. And I think that's one of its great strengths and probably hasn't been um, played up often enough. Yeah. Uh, let's um, move on. I'm, I'm still not getting any audio from either of you guys at JLA, for which I, I feel so bad for you, because it must be so frustrating for you sitting there and, uh, and yeah, not being able, exactly. And Hold up signs, Chris. We'll write <laughs> messages on signs. <laughs> I wanted to ask uh, Karen in particular, and Chris, if he was was there, uh, is about the way that the uh, industry has changed. I mean, we've in our uh, lifetimes, we've all seen it change dramatically. Um, and one of the things that's very been very noticeable is the uh, with the coming of the internet, the the, the kind of the leap to do-it-yourself travel, where people have been able to go out and book the component bits themselves. Now. 
I, one of the trends that I detected a few years ago, uh, talking to consumers, was that, that, that some of them were beginning to um, come back again, to return. And I was wondering, Karen, if, you, if you're getting that effect, where you're getting people coming back to you and going, well, we, we tried doing it ourselves, but actually, um, I've just realized what a, you know, a tour operator or a travel agent is for. Yes, I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, uh, there's definitely a time when a lot of our clients were sort of slightly seduced by the DIY element um, and definitely went off and did, did exploring um, you know, on the internet, etc, etc, etc. But we, there has definitely been a return to uh, relying on the specialist operator because when people actually do try and do it themselves, they realise um, that sometimes it's just not possible. In our case, a lot of the wineries that we go and visit are just frankly not open to the general public. Um, and so it's just not possible to physically go and visit them. People don't realise the amount, the huge amount of work uh, that goes into setting up an itinerary. Um, people do off, sometimes and often take advice from some of the online um, advice forums. Yet, as we always say to them, you're, you're taking advice from people you don't know, you don't know what their standards are, uh, what they term as luxury could be very different to you, whereas dealing with an expert, um, as I say, they've been to the destination, they've slept in the hotel, etc. And of course it comes back to the financial bonding that you were mentioning earlier as well, Alistair, which you just don't get if you try and piece various bits and pieces of the itinerary together yourself. Steve, do you have any views on that? Yeah, I completely agree. It's of course it's seductive to think you could do it yourself. Um, you want to save a few bob, but I, t I totally agree. I think it's, if you're going to take five breaks, holidays a year, which sounds excessive, but I mean a weekend away to Paris, whatever, uh, you can you can do breaks yourself. You get a good hotel, you book Rio Star, that's to Paris, and that's absolutely fine. But I went to Armenia in um, spring, and I wouldn't even begin to think about trying to well, put it this way, we bought the flight, but then we got a ground agent down there, but who was bonded, but who we set the itinerary we wanted, he came back and said, that's not possible, this is possible, because the mountain pass is closed, or that's shut, or that's reopened. So while we did do a DIY element, of course you brought in an expert of some type who's bonded in some way to, to make sure that you're not stuck on a mountain pass you can't get through, and your transport driver is buggered off or is broken down. And it, it'd just be foolish to to try and do that. Having said that, online, of course, is giving you much more advice, information that was never there before, and will continue to do so. Uh, so you have more ideas, possibly, of what you want to do, but if it involves cost, if it involves your partner or family, you're really going to be very foolish to, to take a risk on that. I went to a travel... Uh, show a couple of years ago and was on a, a stand for one of uh, Chris's um, competitors, another ATO member. Uh, and I was talking to several uh, people who were coming there, uh, coming onto the stand. Uh, and I, I remember a young couple in particular who were talking about going to uh, Latin America, touring around uh, South America. And they, they, they said, that, you know, last year we did this ourselves. But we spent the whole time thinking to ourselves, this hotel's lovely, but Actually, we don't know it's the best one in town, <laughs> um, and 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 also worrying about what might be sort of down the road. In other words, if something goes wrong, if our bus connection doesn't make it, or our you know whatever it is, that w what, what do we do there? Because we're really on our own two feet. And I think that Karen isn't it, is 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 one of the big the big aspects of this. You've, you've got somebody you can phone up and say help. Absolutely, yeah. Um, you know, like all other ATO operators, uh, we have a 24-hour helpline, so that's always there for clients, and it's usually me on the end of the phone. Um, and I have dealt with emergencies in the middle of the night, so there's certainly that aspect of reassurance that you get when you book with a recognised operator. And just coming back um, to, to picking up on what Steve was saying, his trip to Armenia, again, if you book with an expert, it just does give you that greater option. We have clients, for example, on a wine tour in Georgia at the moment, um, it is just physically not possible to organise your own wine tour of Georgia. I took people, a group of 30 clients, um, through uh, the Bacar Valley in Lebanon. Again, mm. that is not something you can do on your own. You would be foolish to do that on your own. Um, and I think having that backup, which can uh, operate in lots of levels, but a, a physical and practical backup is a huge reassurance um, and takes a weight of worry. Um, off, you know, planning a trip and, and experiencing a trip. It means you can get the most out of it. You don't have to worry like you're, you're the people you spoke to were worrying about. Oh, is this the best restaurant for us? Um, have I tasted the best wine? 
oh, you know, we tell our class there's actually going to be a fiesta in, the, in um, that village, or there's going to be this going on, or that going on. It really means that you can make absolute maximum use of your time. And let's face it, time is very precious to all of us these days. Mm. Is not the uh, temple uh, at um, in the Bekar Valley uh, the what's it called the, the, the Baalbek? Yes, is is that not the most fabulous temple ever? Absolutely <laughs> incredible! Yeah. As um, said, yeah, actually, coming back to that, the, the week before we were due to fly out, the SEO changed their advice, and in fact, uh, that that became off limits. But I was I was able to arrange something else for the clients. If you were on your own, a I don't know if you've yeah. necessarily picked up that that area was off limits. Which could again bring all sorts of complications. Yeah. What about because one of the things that people fear, that consumers fear, is that, uh, or not so much fear, but at least recognise, is that if they are coming to a, a tour operator um, with all that expertise, with all the benefits we've just been describing, um, they're also having to, uh, in effect, pay for that, uh, and they don't know how much more they're having to pay for it that actually justifies the service. In other words, can you? Um, nearly match the kind of prices they might do on DIY or is it a, a big gap? Um, in, from our perspective, uh, it, we operate we, we look at it quite with our group trips, um, it, it would be very, very difficult for someone to, to uh, off, for someone to experience the holiday that we're offering if they did it, did it themselves, frankly, for, for a, a, a lesser price. In terms of when we have small groups of independent travellers, so people who contact us who are just two, four, or six, etc., what we're doing increasingly now is giving them the option of saying, you can pay on the spot directly to, for example, the winery um, for any tasting costs, and therefore you can decide on the spot which wines you want to taste at what level and how many, etc. Ditto with uh, meals. We make the reservation, etc., so they know they're going to uh, somewhere that suits their, their, their requirements. But again, they pay directly to the supplier. So again, they're choosing their, their sort of budget. So with those, with the smaller groups and these sort of independent groups, then we, we are we can be a, a little bit more transparent, and that does seem to be working quite well. So of course, you've, yes, you've got you've got economies of scale that you can uh, that you can put into play there that will offset the, the cost of the services, in effect. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, one of the things that uh, we were talking about earlier was this business of um, you know the way the whole industry is changing and the influence of the internet. Uh, that's brought benefits and it's brought disadvantages. Um, I'm curious to know what we're going to have soon uh, is a new layer. There's a, a, a product that my um, uh, friends in Google um, tell me are introducing in October, which will be a, a, a version of Hangouts um, called Helpouts, so where individuals will be able to uh, literally sell their services. So in other words, if you are um, a music teacher or a French teacher or a cook or a mechanic or an IT person, um, you can uh, have one-to-one -one Hangouts with people and they pay for your uh, help and expertise and, and, and guidance. And you can charge them to Google Wallet for, uh, you know, for, for, for a session or for a number of minutes or whatever it might be. But it also will be the case that that will develop and that we'll, we'll find is we'll find more and more, in effect, travel counsellors. So uh, my question really is, uh, will, you know, the people will be setting themselves up, expats living in uh, Beijing will be setting themselves up as experts on dining out in Beijing. Um, and so it'll make it easier for consumers to go and get sort of direct on the ground advice about particular destinations. So how do you compete against that? Because the, it seems to me that the one thing you've got is the ability to book, which they don't. But that's about it, isn't it? Karen, I think, thank you. I think some, that some of the same issues will apply that we've been talking about already. Um, you still don't know these people. They don't have any sort of um, backup, any kind of bonding, any sort of license. Obviously, some of them through their profession will. Um, but just because they happen to live somewhere, they're not going to be physically necessarily to help you when things go wrong. Their advice is still very much their own personal opinion. It won't necessarily have been tested. Obviously, that will change over time. So I think some of the issues will still be will will still be relevant. And I think just coming back to, to the bonding issue, which you know you spoke right spoke about right at the very beginning, that is actually very very important. Um, and knowing that that you are protected and will be looked after in the event of emergency, I think is pretty priceless. One thing that the internet has certainly brought uh, is the uh, 
that whole element of transparency. You know, people can see what's happening at, at every level. Um, can, are you having to adjust to that? Are you having to be more transparent in the way that you're working? Um, just, Actually, Karen, tell you what, just before you answer that, um, Chris can put his hand up with a, a thumbs up or a thumbs down as, a, as an answer to that question. Are you having to be more transparent, Chris? <laughs> No, not looking that way. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> okay. To a certain extent, um, and again, it, it very much depends on the actual uh, product that you're selling. And in the the, the uh, world that we operate, so much of what we do, just you cannot, you just cannot buy it anywhere else. Mm. Um, but and people expect to pay a, a, you know a, a surcharge for uh, something which is just unobtainable elsewhere. Um, but yes, you're absolutely right. Obviously, if you're, you're using a hotel, you're naming your hotel, clients can very easily go onto the hotel's website and find out how much the, the cost is to stay there. Yeah. Uh, what quite often clients don't realise is that the price that's quoted on the web won't necessarily include the tax, doesn't necessarily include breakfast. Um, quite often, we're putting them into superior rooms. Um, that price is quite often only relevant, you know, if you book it there and then you pay in full, it's non-refundable, etc., etc., etc. And then once that's explained to people, then they do understand a bit more. Because presumably they're doing exactly that. I mean, they they are um, going online, looking at. I mean, they'll, they'll look at perhaps what you're offering. They'll then look at the hotel, and they'll um, come along to you and say, well, "Look, I can see the hotel is costing this much. Can can you match it?" Yeah, absolutely. We do get those sorts of questions all the time. Um, and what we quite often say to clients is, "That's fine. If you want to book the hotel, then you book it. We will take this much off your holiday. But if you arrive there and your room has been double booked." You're on your own. Um, any extras that you need to pay, obviously, you know, you need to make sure you've asked all the right questions so you're not in for any nasty surprises. Um, if we make an adjustment to our trip for whatever reason and we decide to use a different hotel, you are then possibly in a slightly tricky situation, um, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, of course, we try and help clients wherever we can, um, but we are always very, very clear about what we are offering, what you get if you book with our Blaster and Clark White Tours, and possibly what you may not get if you make an independent booking. Steve, coming back to your article um, mm. back there in 2003, uh, surprising how many of those uh, independent